napalm used in Vietnam. According to the Geneva Convention, civilians and civilian objects may not be attacked in any circumstances by incendiary bombs. Basically, the use of white phosphorus is banned in any populated zones. The American Army claims to have used it only to illuminate combat zones. Yet in Fallujah, thousands of inhabitants were still in the city during the bombing. Abu Yunus arranges to meet me at the Martyr Cemetery, a former football stadium. 3,500 bodies are buried here, resistance fighters and civilians alike. This is where Abu Yunus played football. Today, he comes to meditate at the graves of former teammates, now become martyrs. Some of the footballers who, who used to play in this stadium are, are buried here. Even the coach, we called him Khalil Cowboy. Even he was killed by the Americans. And all, I think 13 players from the Fallujah team are buried in their own football ground. This man is the caretaker of the cemetery. One day in November 2004, while burying the victims of the fighting, he made a strange discovery. The Americans brought me sacks. At first, I, I thought it was humanitarian aid. But when I opened them, just look what I found. Bits of bones and clothes intact. Their translator told me these corpses were American. And that's why they'd given them back. The caretaker recovered close to 500 unidentified bodies. He photographed each one before burying them in the cemetery. So we asked the doctors, and they told us that if there are only bones and the clothing is intact, then it's because of white phosphorus. And what happened to this man? Well, it looks like it's due to a chemical weapon. God knows what it is. But that's phosphorus too. The caretaker is in no doubt. These men were killed by white phosphorus. Did the U.S. Army use these weapons against the population? What are these photos really hiding? To find an answer, I must go to the United States. Far from Iraq and its ruined buildings, Austin. I made contact with Ross Caputi, a 27-year-old former Marine who fought at Fallujah. Though he looks like a teenager, Ross Caputi is already a war veteran. Traumatized by his experience, he decided to testify. This is me. This is in Fallujah. And uh, I'm really embarrassed to say that I'm kind of posing for this picture. Um, you know, I had the bandana on and I wanted to look tough. And, you know, this is the mentality that we had while we were in there. Um, we were tough war fighters and, um, you know, these are the type of pictures I wanted to go home and tell my friends about. In Fallujah, Ross was a radio operator. It was his job to relay information to the other soldiers. He was therefore on the front line. Before the ground siege actually began, they told us that this was going to be the biggest battle since Hue City, Vietnam. They were bombing the city really, really heavily at this point. And they put us on this hill outside the city, kind of overlooking it the night before, before the ground siege began. And at this point, I, I remember very clearly seeing the white phosphorus. Um, and I remember very clearly, like, having this weird feeling about it, like, this can't possibly be legal. I, I remember seeing it, like, sway down in the wind like this. I asked a lieutenant close to me about it. Um, I said, hey, is this, is this legal? And he said, yes, it's legal because we're using it as a smoke screen. We're not using it offensively. And there were thousands of civilians who couldn't leave the city. So wherever we used it, there was a strong possibility that this was going to land on civilians. So white phosphorus was indeed discharged above the population. Now I feel really guilty about it. Um, now I'm, I'm fully aware of how many people I hurt and how many people we killed. So that's not easy to live with. Ross Caputi decided to quit the army after the Battle of Fallujah. He set up an association to make American public opinion aware of his experience as a soldier in Iraq. 
I remember that in my unit there was very little curiosity about who these insurgents in Muj were. Everyone just seemed content with the rumors that we had heard about them being terrorists and Baathist diehards and anti-Americans of all different sorts. Though Ross Caputi denounces the use of white phosphorus, others in the military are glad of it. In March 2005, an American army major made surprising revelations. In this army review, he claims that the use of white phosphorus proved highly effective in Fallujah. He adds that he used it willingly against the insurgents. The major refers to such deployment as shake-and-bake missions. According to this officer, white phosphorus was used in Iraq to kill. Given this damning evidence, the international press seized upon the story. They would have to wait until November 16, 2005 for the American administration to officially admit to the media that the city was bombed with white phosphorus. Back to Fallujah, seven years after the bombing, the population is convinced that white phosphorus is still killing. Such is the case with Khalil. He lives in the Jolong neighborhood, one of the hardest hit by the bombing. In 2005, Khalil founded the first charity for war victims. His aim? To gather as much information as possible, beginning with these files on sick children. This child, for example, developed a brain tumor just after the bombing back in 2004. And it's the same in this case. There's a, a serious malformation problem from birth. So we record the information, we establish a, a medical file, and then we send it off to the doctors and charities. All we really want to try and do is find a solution and, and help these poor families. It's a modest office. Khalil doesn't have extensive resources, not even a computer on which to record all this information. He seems overtaken by events. You know, we knew absolutely nothing about any of these diseases before. When the Americans came here, they were supposed to bring us modernity. Instead, they've sent us back to the Stone Age. Khalil agreed to supply us with the files of sick children. He says that most cases of rare illnesses concern children under 10, like Ziad. He was born after the 2004 attacks with a serious malformation. He is the first case of this type in his family. He was operated on when, when he was 47 days old. The house we lived in was bombed. When we returned, I cleaned the place entirely. Maybe it was because of that. Uh, I don't know. Your house was bombed during the battle? Yes. It was hit by a missile, and half the house was destroyed. The living room? My bedroom, all of it, was destroyed. The furniture, too. All we had left was, was what we're wearing, was this wardrobe. We rebuilt everything ourselves. One year later, my, my son was born with a malformation, and I was told it was linked to the bombing. How long did you stay in that house? Two years. We, we left the house a year after I gave birth. Why are children who were not alive during the war and who were therefore not exposed directly to white phosphorus, victims of malformations. What do the Iraqi authorities say? Is it a public health problem? In Fallujah, only the Ministry of the Environment was willing to talk to us. The truth is, we haven't been able to do any environmental surveys. I mean, it was impossible to carry out any tests at all. The bombing started in 2004, then once again in 2005 and 2006, all the way up until 2010. It was only in 2010 that the Americans left the city. And at that time, if a citizen bent down to pick something up, for example, well, he looked like a potential bomber. And an American sniper might even shoot him. And that happened several times, I can tell you. All this to say, 
It was nigh on impossible for us to go to any of these zones with our equipment and carry out our tests. It was far too dangerous. In Fallujah, nobody has the means to investigate the causes of these illnesses, not even the Iraqi Ministry of the Environment. This upsurge in deformed children isn't among the authorities' priorities. The former rebel stronghold has been sidelined by its own government. A code of silence reigns in Fallujah. Since the end of the war, just one study has shed some light on this. It was carried out in Fallujah in 2009 and was published in a major medical review. This document contains worrying results about the rise in the number of deformed babies. They reveal an explosion in such cases since 2005, one year after the Battle of 2004. Aberystwyth on the west coast of Wales. The author of this paper is Professor Chris Busby, a British scientist specializing in radioactivity. He's secretary of the European Committee on Radiation Risks. Chris Busby is a regular mainstream media guest. In his Black Beret, he has become an easily recognizable figure on the BBC or Al Jazeera. He was recently consulted on the consequences of the nuclear crisis at Fukushima. Unlike the Iraqi authorities, he has investigated in Fallujah. But the way around that is to just knock on the door and say, excuse me, I'm, I'm asking you, uh, how many people have got cancer here in the last five years and who lives here? And it's very simple. Because if you know who lives there and how old they are, you can, you can then predict how many cancers they should have on the basis of the national average and rates and so on, and just compare them with the numbers that they report. And the one divided by the other is a relative risk. So we did that. Did you try to go by yourself to Fallujah? No way. I've got too many people after my gut, so I'm not going to go and stick myself out there. Somebody will pop a bullet through me. So, um... My uh, did you, did you, uh, yeah, well, I, all I did was I told them what to do. I said, look, I'll tell you what to do. I'll create the questionnaire um, based on the ones I've done. And even for an Iraqi team recruited by Chris Busby, the task was complicated. There's some places they went to, they got beaten up because they thought they were from the Secret Service or the state or the CIA or something. So then we had to start sending people around with uh, some local person that everybody knew, counselor or something. And after that, it was okay. And we just finished it when the Iraqi government found out about it. And then they put out something on the television saying we were terrorists and anybody who answered the questions would go to jail. But it was too late. We'd done it by then, you see. On top of the questionnaire, Chris Busby asked for samples of soil and water. Samples of residents' hair were also taken. The test results are astonishing. In these hair samples and the soil samples and all, we measured 52 different elements. So we looked at strontium and barium and neodymium and, and cobalt and ca copper and cesium and calcium and you name it, we looked at it. And what we found was that the only element there that could explain that level of congenital malformations and cancer was uranium. He believes it's not the white phosphorus that is harming the inhabitants of Fallujah, but uranium. So, for instance, in Fallujah, the rates of uh, the rates of leukemia, for example, are 38 times the expected number based on Egypt. Breast cancer is more than 10 times. Childhood cancer is 14 times. I forget the exact details, but they're huge numbers. It's not like nothing that you have ever found in any epidemiological study anywhere ever. This is like the highest rate of, of, of genetic damage in any population ever studied. It's worse than Hiroshima. Why is Fallujah compared to Hiroshima? How did uranium come to be in this city? Officially, no nuclear weapons were used in Fallujah. I continue my inquest in Champaign, Illinois, 200 kilometers.